Okay, well, we're about um, four or five minutes in, so I think we should, it's pretty good to get started. Um, hi, everybody who's on. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to talk to you today. My name is Elizabeth Egan. I'm a business development representative here at Call Hub, and I'm so excited to be here with Alex James. He is one of the co-founders of 10 Burroughs Research over in the UK. Um, Alex has had a wonderful career. He's worked with nonprofits and political campaigns, helping turn their supporters into members and advocates as well. Um, he's here with uh, Andrew Campbell, who's his co-founder. He's going to be joining us a little bit later for the Q&A session. They started 10 Burrows together back in 2017. Um, and they'll just be talking about the five you know, best things you need to know when running successful phone canvassing campaigns, um, along with some of the, the success they found at 10 Burrows in general. Um, so yeah, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and leave the stage and let Alex take it away and present for all you guys. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much uh, to Elizabeth for the very kind introduction and to Call Hub for inviting me to lead this webinar today, um, just after 4 p.m. here in the UK. Um, everyone, I'm going to use the chat quite aggressively today in terms of getting feedback and talking to uh, talking to everyone. So everyone who's online, just post in the chat quickly. Just say hi and where you're dialing in from this afternoon. So while everyone's doing that, I'm going to just explain that I'll take the approach today as it's kind of around 11 on the East Coast um, and, you know, uh, late afternoon here. I'm going to take this approach as like a coffee break. I'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes and then open up the floor to questions. Um, so hi there, Trudy. Hi there. Hi there, the guys from Silver Spring. Uh, to introduce myself together with my friend and colleague, hi there, Stu, in Chicago. So together with my friend and colleague, Andrew Campbell, I'm the co-founder of Tenborough's Research here in the UK. Um, I've spent my career converting spreadsheets to heartbeats through communications mastery. For over a decade, I've worked at the intersection of data and communications for political parties and charitable organisations. I've been lucky to be at the centre of some of the UK's most impactful campaigns at multiple general elections and the referendum on Scottish independence. Outside of political campaigning, I've harnessed data in campaigns in trade and the arts as well. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, just scan the QR code and that will take you straight to my profile. To introduce 10 Burrows, as I said, the company is based in Manchester, where I met my friend and now colleague, Andrew Campbell. Um, at Tembro, as we transform the relationship between organisations and their members and supporters, engaging and driving them to action. Through person-to-person -person contact over the telephone, we turn mem supporters into members into the greatest advocates. Identifying the needs and motivation, which is by identifying the needs and motivations of members through engaging surveys delivered through personalised telephone conversations on Call Hub. Using that data to predict the behavior of members and using AI to build unique profiles and then do, taking all of that information, all of that work to deliver mandates in favor of action by providing field operations, persuading members to lend their support. We get results after receiving a telephone call from us, members are twice as likely to complete an action and our calls are 113% effective when compared to other campaign tactics. We identify the members most likely to participate, to leave, and the future activists. And we increase turnout by more than 50% amongst members engaged by our field operations team. If you'd like to learn more, there's a QR code on screen just now. Visit our website. Um, as you may know, the UK will have a general election on July the 4th, and we're advising a number of clients, but we do have capacity available over the final two weeks. As I say, scan the QR code and get in touch. We're always happy to talk about any projects that you have in mind if you're UK based. So to introduce the webinar this afternoon, I'm gonna share our five lessons for great conversations in telephone campaigns. And I think before I begin, it's useful just to take a step back and ask why the telephone is so important. If you've seen any of the coverage in, here in the UK of our general election, when the media do discuss campaign technologies, you know, the focus is on social media, on TikTok, you know, essentially on technologies that are less than 20 years old. The telephone, however, has existed in some form since the 1840s, but is still so important today. 
because wherever you are in the world, the basic service remains the same. For well over 100 years, landline telephones have provided a uniform and universal service to households across the UK, giving campaigns the most widespread coverage of voters. The almost universal presence of a telephone in homes and now as a mobile device makes them an obvious tool for political organising. Candidates, political parties, trade unions and other campaign groups can make their case to voters in a simple and mediated fashion. In the UK, there's a perception that the landline use may be in steep decline, but in 2018, our communications regulator Ofcom found that 81% of households still had a landline. Among those groups likely to vote in an election, 92% had access to a landline, whilst only 48% had internet access at home. There are clearly still parts of the electorate who could only be reached by telephone. So distilling your message into one-to-one -one interactions with voters is the biggest challenge we think every campaign faces. And I'll explain how we have great conversations every single time. So the first lesson this afternoon is to listen to the data. Every conversation is unique. And in any campaign, you may only have the opportunity to speak to someone once. The challenge is to identify what works, implement it across the campaign, and scale that out to every single call. Does the script hit our key messages? Are voters raising issues that we did not anticipate? Is the reaction to the call what we hoped it would be? Our mantra is analyze, learn, practice, perform. When we began making our first telephone calls as a company back in 2017, our solution was to listen to a sample of outgoing calls every day. This generated valuable data that we could turn into feedback and raise our standards higher. But until recently, there's no cost effective way to do that at scale. Thanks to Call Hub's AI sentiment analysis tool, from the moment our first call is finished, there's now quantifiable data available about that conversation. We can analyze our campaign in real time, develop lessons learned, share those with our team and boost performance instantly. To paraphrase a well-known maxim, no campaign survives contact with reality and you should be humble enough to be challenged by what the data tells you. You may only get to speak to someone once and you maximize your chances of having a great conversation by listening to what the data is telling you. The second lesson, say it again. When you've repeated your message a hundred times, there's still someone hearing it for the first time. And we see telephone calling as part of an ongoing conversation between a campaign and a voter. I'm going to open this up to the chat just now. On your campaigns that you, you've you all worked on, how many points of contact do you aim to have with, with voters over the course of that campaign? Include everything in it, leaflets, text messages, social media, telephone calls how many how many points of contact do you aim for so yeah seven to, we're hearing seven to ten in the chat yeah four to five yeah all good all, all all good. I mean, typically we found that campaigns that we've worked on should aim for between five to seven points of contact between the beginning and end of their campaign. And the conversation does not end from our perspective when the telephone call finishes. You have to reiterate your message in every single interaction. Other communications anchored around telephone calls could be some of the most effective tactics available to campaign managers. It could be as simple as a message to expect a call from a campaign or an acknowledgement that you've had a conversation. We've used the Call Hub workflows extensively to personalize our follow-ups after telephone calls. Sometimes, you know, sometimes depending on the conversation, depending on how critical that voter is, how close your election is, your campaign is, the most effective follow-ups are the most effective follow-ups are written letters from your campaign principles. Which leads me on to my next lesson. Making it personal. So um, I won't ask you to post in the chat this time, but can anyone who's ever done any media training course raise their hand in the in the console just now? If that functions there. Yes.
So for those who have done the any kind of media training courses, acknowledge bridge control is a technique that's been taught in every single course that I've done. And it's something I think about when preparing for campaigns. For those that haven't come across it, to explain briefly, when you're asked a question in an interview, you acknowledge the premise, you bridge to your answer by enlarging the context, and finally control the conversation by delivering your key message. That's fine in a one-on-one -on -one interview where you know the parameters of the conversation, but can your agents do the same when, this is, when you're making calls at scale? If an agent is challenged live on a call, how can they be supported to pivot away from danger when, frankly, we're in a situation where every conversation counts? As campaign managers, we ask agents and volunteers to go to situations on the telephone, knowing more about a candidate's programme than anyone else. So we see the solution as creating scripts that are unique as the conversation that is happening. And technology helps us achieve that. An anecdote from the start of my career, when I was working on campaigns that wanted to achieve this back in you know, the uh, uh, early, you know, the mid to late noughties, when campaigns wanted to personalize conversations, they used scripts with interchangeable color sheets of paper, depending on which issues were raised and which branch of script the agent should follow. Today, a call hubs branching script feature means that agents, agents need never leave the screen. The opportunities to personalize are limitless. In call hub, we've built scripts with over 100 possible variations, which boost the response rates as members particularly feel your agents really understand them and their relationship with their campaign, or their organization, whichever, whoever you're speaking to them on behalf of. Lesson number four is to use Lego bricks, which is an analogy I heard at a conference last year, which I really like. So everyone knows what a Lego brick is. And if you think about a Lego brick, it's got fairly arbitrary parameters. You know, there are set shapes, set sizes, which to build something, you don't need to build bricks that are bespoke to you. Instead, you work within the constraints that Lego has set out and create something unique that way. As I said earlier, no campaign survives contact with reality. Messages are tweaked, languages and scripts are toughened. In project management speak, you probably call it a change in scope. For us, throughout all of the noise, the focus remains on the conversation and the action that we want someone to take following that and working back from there. In the UK, the last, last week, the parties released their manifestos for government. At this point, uh, five years ago, in the previous general election, we were talking to members of a large trade union who wanted to add a response paragraph to their script based on the manifesto launches. The complication here was that this would be unique to every member we were speaking to, as the response wasn't only based on the content of the manifestos, but issues the members had raised in a survey earlier in the campaign. So working within uh, the constraints that we had set ourselves, we came up with a really creative solution in our existing call hub campaign, using custom fields to seamlessly integrate this into the script. There were easier ways to solve this problem. You know, we could have created a bespoke solution on another platform. However, the challenge for us was would changing all of that, all of our processes, moving all of our integrations, would that have given those members we were speaking to a better experience? I think the analogy of Lego bricks speaks to the intrinsic flexibility for telephone calling has over other communication methods. Uh, this week, The Guardian uh, reported that the Conservative Party, the party of the Prime Minister, uh, is reliant on nationally focused printed leaflets with no mention of local issues or local candidates, which are often delivered alongside takeaway menus and other junk mail. Obviously, having been a campaign organiser, you know, those leaflets would have been or at least a week out of date. You know, the copy would have had to have been sent to the printer at least a week before they landed for them to be printed, sent and delivered. They can't react through that medium to the changing politics on the ground, the changing situation, the changing narrative of the campaign. The advance for telephone calling is it offers you what the same basic service offers you the flexibility to tailor your message at a moment's notice. The final lesson, don't forget about the when. So you need to be the right person in the right place at the right time. And what I mean by this is that when you call these are sometimes as important as the script and the message. There's a challenge not only faced by campaigns, 
for anyone who relies on any organization that relies on person to person communication. As voters, members, or customers switch away from landlines to mobile telephones, there is evidence from the polling industry that it is becoming more difficult to reach them and contact rates are decreasing, meaning fewer conversations. There's no point having a great message and a fantastic script if no one is available to hear it. As with lesson one, this is where a data informed approach is vital. You could perhaps warn voters to expect a call from you, allow them to select a window to receive that call, segmenting them in ma as many ways as possible, job location, years of service, anything, anything, that, anything that works. My best advice is that you need to be flexible and listen to the data. Something that worked before may not work now, but we're proud that our contact rates comfortably exceed comparable companies here in the UK. So I think to kind of wrap up some of the ideas here, um, I've made my first campaign call as a volunteer 17 years ago. And even since founding the company with Andrew a mere seven years ago, the way conversations have changed over the, the way we utilize kind of telephone conversations has changed completely. My starting point is that the telephone, like every technology, is first and foremost is a tool and it's a tool to support conversations. Where we as campaign managers add value is by enhancing those conversations, developing our teams and supporting our campaigners. I think there are some really exciting developments on the horizon. For example, the, AI, the development of AI models over the past 12 to 18 months has made a real impact, um, as I described earlier, in improving the conversations that we have. It could potentially have an even greater role in supporting campaigns. I mean, I would hope that this time, by this time next year, AI would be at a point where live feedback can be given to a team while they're on the phone making calls about the issues that have arisen in other calls during the campaign and, where appropriate, the lines that they need to take in response. All methods of communicating are challenges. The pressure to adapt to changing habits is constant. But one-to-one -one conversations on the telephone are still the most efficient way for campaigns to persuade and mobilise. Thanks very much for your time so far this afternoon, everyone. It's been a pleasure to uh, to talk to you all. Um, if you want to learn more about our work or get in touch, please don't hesitate to contact us. I'll leave this on the screen just now. I'm going to invite Elizabeth back on stage and my business partner, Andrew Campbell, to join us and open this up to questions. Hey everybody, feel free to um, throw your questions in the chat and we can read them aloud too. So actually, uh, I have a question for Alex and Andrew just to start us off. Um, I know we just talked about AI a little bit. What impact do you think that AI is going to have on political communi communications like in the future? Uh, so if you, if you don't mind me taking this one, Alex. Um, Go ahead. I, I, think, I think it's quite interesting. You know, we, we, if you look at the general election that we're having at the moment in the UK, uh, you know, could you say that AI is, is being widely used, having much of an effect? Mm -hmm. Not really, not really at all. To be honest, um, you know, in some ways, that's there's kind of a good side of that. The kind of fear is kind of super convincing, kind of Russian bots kind of thing is 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 there's no evidence of that. Um, and you know, as Alex said, a lot of the the money and resources and time is still going into you know uh, leaflets through people's doors and and things like that. They were printed kind of weeks away, so we're not seeing we're not seeing it yet in terms of you know the sort of uh, playing a large part in campaigns. Mm -hmm. But I think if we look at some of the sort of the, the, the tools that are coming about, a lot of the the applications that people are finding for the technology, um, like for example, the the, the sentiment analysis that Call Hub have, um, you know, it's that kind of that kind of softer skills that kind of you couldn't get from a, a spreadsheet. So you can, you know, the the kind of you know, you've got ten thousand conversations it's very difficult to tell sort of how were they? What was their tone like? What was the, how receptive were they to particular parts of the script, how particular messages? And it's it's that kind of, you know, kind of be able to kind of deduce motion almost really from from 
responses that is kind of quietly um you know very revolutionary and i think you know when you look more widely at kind of how this is slowly going to feed through to things like perhaps polling mm -hmm. uh and i'm sure messaging you know you there there will be uh increasing as i said you know the, the, it's only going to increase really even if we're kind of shouldn't get ahead of ourselves at this point you know in terms of how much of a difference it's making at right now at the moment on kind of a macro scale um for example alex and i the project working on at the moment called campaign mail where we're kind of you know a lot of people run um campaigns that are targeting elected representatives kind of influencing campaigns uh where they'll kind of send around a template saying oh you know contact your your congressman or contact your member of parliament and you know kind of so you'll find that a uh, uh, member of congress or a a uh, member of parliament is kind of inundated with this kind of same template, you know, kind of, um, and they'll, they kind of instantly recognize and kind of deal with it as if it's just kind of a, an influencing campaign. Whereas we're trying to uh, build a tool that kind of allows people to, you know, you kind of take a template, but then you can kind of personalize it using, using generative AI to try and make sure that kind of people's, uh, you know, you're not getting that kind of uh, mass campaign kind of, Kind of feel to it and allowing people to kind of get over what they what they actually are trying to convey to their elected representatives so that's just kind of one of the one of the applications is it having kind of you know if we look at the uk general election is it kind of one of the big deciding factors is it kind of a large part of people's campaigns at this point no uh you know it isn't in the european elections either that i can see might not be in the us elections but um you know it's something that increasingly people are finding those those uses for yeah, I know. I think um, being on top of it now is, is so important, you know, for the future. Yeah, and I think just to add to what Andrew said very briefly with kind of a UK specific example, um, you know, direct mail, um, sorry, just to explain very briefly, I wrote my master's thesis in political marketing and kind of you when you're doing a kind of a big project like that, you kind of learn random facts and during that process. And one of them was that the first mail merging and direct mail kind of techniques of kind of personalizing letters came to the UK, I think in the 1980s. But it wasn't until, you know, 2005, 2010, that actually these kind of techniques had advanced to a, to a level of complexity, that actually they were effective tools in the in the political campaigns, mm. um, we've seen the same with social media um, more recently. You know, I think every one of the past four elections was meant to be the social media election, and actually, over time, as social media has been able to kind of provide a greater level of targeting and sophistication, actually, parties have used it, and it has become much more effective. And I think AI is on the same journey. We are essentially in you know the nineteen eighties of AI at the moment. You know, it will take a couple of cycles for campaigners to kind of build and develop techniques and an evidence base that they work um, before we kind of see a much more widespread adoption. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so we have some questions in the chat as well. Uh, just starting from the beginning, uh, user26 said, you know, sometimes I find that scripts are are read quite robotically by their callers. You know, do you have any advice on writing scripts to make conversations more natural or is stronger training the only option, the only way to do that? Um, so um, if you don't mind, I'll jump in first on this one, Andrew. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think the previous, there are a couple of cool hub webinars on kind of script writing, which are really kind of excellent. So I'd kind of, Guys, you there for some ideas. I think from our perspective, I think, you know, we, uh, I mean, my view is that and I think it's in kind of espoused more eloquently in a book called The Goldmine Effect. And I think it's by Rasmus Ankerson. He basically says you need to do something for 10,000 hours to become really, really good at it. And it's the same with kind of reading and delivering a script. You know, the more you do it, the better you will become at it. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add, Andrew, on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, there's kind of, I, I remember myself and I kind of employed a, um, uh, a copywriter who kind of did kind of advertising and marketing copy um, to get his insights onto 
to to to, to telephone scripts, and that was quite interesting. You know, in terms of in terms of presentation, I think it, particularly we, you know, I think one of the things having maybe phonetic spellings of of things like um, like uh, URLs um, or particularly maybe a pronunciation guides to particular places. I think there's nothing worse when you're kind of ringing somewhere and you don't know how to pronounce kind of a town or a village or, you know, somebody's name, the candidate's name even sometimes if it's particularly difficult to pronounce, having kind of phonetic guides to it as well. But I think, I think what I think, it, there's the script itself, but I think also it's kind of explaining you know, a lot of the stuff we do has been around trade unions and trade union campaigns and uh, sort of what we call strike, you know, industrial action ballots in the UK, that there's various laws and rules regulating it. And I think we find that the best way to kind of have people uh, speaking naturally and kind of coming across is to kind of inform them about the campaign. And so let's say there's a, a industrial action ballots for teachers going on strike, for example. I, I think it's just kind of informing people about the background to it. And kind of uh, making sure they kind of understand why it is what you're trying to convey. Particularly, it, I mean, it's different when it's kind of volunteers often. But you know, if you're if you're particularly if you kind of having kind of paid phone banking often, you know, it really just kind of trying to explain as much background as possible. And I, f I find always, you know, there's tips and tricks in terms of formatting and phonetics, and you know, in terms of the delivery of a script but we usually find i think if you if you can explain why it is your phone call and what you're trying to get out of the phone call and what the whole point of the kind of campaign you, you're doing is then that kind of loosens people up and you know they can kind of be a bit more natural kind of back and forth um between the phone call and the people the people you're speaking to yeah great um, and then we have another question, you know, how much communication is, is too much with phone calls, texting campaigns, email campaigns, et cetera. A supporter can be, you know, contacted several times in a week or even a day. So what have you found to be a good balance between that? I mean, it's a great question. And, um, and I think, you know, it will depend. I think there are kind of multiple, I think we have to take a step back at this problem. I don't think there is kind of a one size fits all rule here. I mean, it will depend upon the organization that you're working with or the kind of the, the universe of voters, if it's an election campaign, the aim of the campaign or project, you know, if it's, you know, if it's a election campaign, you know, you might want a slightly more aggressive approach in terms of communications than you know, if it's, you know, a kind of internal, internally political uh, project for a union or a union or other membership organisation, for example, um, you know, I'd also have to bear in mind the kind of connected to that, the timing, the time within the campaign. Obviously, if it's a universe of voters and it's an election campaign and it's election day, you lose nothing by hammering the all your communications channels. You know, at the start of the campaign, when you're looking to gather data on your voters, you know, perhaps it's perhaps it's, you know, it's worth kind of toning that down because you don't want, you know, the you don't want them to unsubscribe before you've had a chance to gather their data, which is the most important thing um, throughout any campaign. I don't know if you've got anything to add to Andrew. Yeah, no, I, I think it is that kind of. Um balance between, you know, I want to kind of get my message across, but I also don't want them, particularly, you know, where you're kind of dealing with questions of data protection laws and kind of opt-outs and things like that, where you, you, you might get the opportunity to kind of, uh, to, to kind of make a point if you, if you, they, they somebody feels irritated or, um, uh, by the campaign communications. And I think it's, it's, it's often a fine line with, with judging kind of how much kind of buy into what you're what you're trying to convey does the person have i think uh, for example if you're a member of a political party and somebody that you know you, you're kind of and you're kind of signed up and you're kind of receptive to it or or you're it's a membership organization or trade union you're kind of paid up member and receptive and you are kind of this is something you very proactively kind of opted into then i think it, you know people will obviously be more receptive to to messages and i think there's 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 kind of there's goodwill there that you can kind of um, you can uh, kind of um, 
there can be a high level of communication really and kind of particularly some some like sms you know or, or door knocking really it's quite a, quite an intimate you know kind of um thing so you, you've got to kind of judge it particularly to well really uh, how people are gonna how people are gonna react to that and again you know the converse of that is if it's kind of a a, a campaign maybe a political campaign that you're you're targeting kind of some people who are members of the public then you know i think there's there's kind of got to be kind of acceptable you know that they haven't kind of opted into it that they're, they're kind of it's got to be a particular sensitivity around you know if you you're trying to get your message across but are you doing more harm than good sometimes particularly you know if um you, you know in terms of how you're how you're contacting them particularly if you know you're sort of door knocking you're, you're sending text messages to them you know kind of you're, you're sending the emails kind of where that kind of uh where that line is often often difficult to 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 judge Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then we've, so we have some questions in uh, the question poll too. Um, first one, many people have cell phones and have poll people can see your number and then they don't answer since they already know you and they're familiar with the number. You know, what are your suggestions for that? Yeah, so I think on this one, um, it is, as I kind of mentioned, it is about kind of thinking about the telephone call within the context of the campaign. So actually, you know, what you might want to consider in this situation is contacting whoever this kind of this group of voters this group of members that you want to speak to a few days out um and in, you, you know you can inform them that your the campaign will be calling them over the coming days you know it depends on the kind of level of complexity you could give them the option to opt out the call or schedule it for another day um i think you know obviously there's kind of the idea of cold calling where you just ring someone out the blue and turning it into almost like a warm call, something they know is coming, um, they can expect, even if they don't necessarily look forward to receiving it, they know it's coming. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I think I think we've, and that's something that I think has kind of changed, particularly with you know, platforms such as Call Hub, where you can kind of integrate text messages so easily uh, into it as well. So you can kind of you know, uh, as I said, you, you, it's so easy just to kind of, this is the, these are the people I'm going to be calling this evening as part of my phone bank. I'm going to send them a text message saying, I'm going to call them this evening. Um, uh, you know, explain why, um, because it, it, you know, it's, it, we, you know, there's so many co phone calls we make that, you know, people first few seconds, um, and particularly in the UK, there's kind of a, um, there's kind of a, particularly with mobile numbers, there's, there are a lot of people kind of, um, a lot of, a lot of people who who will you know scammers basically fraudsters who will who will make unsolicited calls to people um so i think there's there's it, it's pretty much a necessity i would say actually in the in the in the uk often that you kind of you kind of send them a text message message from someone that, that they were kind of expecting saying hi it's you know your trade union here um i we you know we we really like to talk to you about this um we're going to be giving you we're going to be bringing members in the next um next couple of hours um, because you know that that will that will increase the number of people who will pick up. That will prepare people for what you want them to talk about, and you know you can do that. I think that's it's a it, often you know people kind of answer their phone and say, oh, who's this? You know, kind of it, it, it. People can feel kind of that you're kind of violating their privacy. And it's sometimes, sometimes, and I think you just got to kind of prepare them for that. Say, oh, this is explain in advance why it is you want them to, you you want to speak to them. Kind of explain in advance, and that's just so easy to do. I suppose these days, like you say, like the question I said with everyone must have cell phones. You know, it's 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 and the the sort of technology is just there to be able to, you know. That you set up a list on Call Hub, you send everyone a text message ahead of the time saying we're going to be calling, and uh, you know if you if you, you wouldn't like us to call, you know, kind of let us know. Um, it, it, it you know, goes a long way, I think. I think it's pretty, and on the UK, just because uh, the amount of kind of that there are kind of scams that, that people target people's cell phones, then it's it's kind of necessary, really. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's such a hard line to teeter on. Um, and for anyone who didn't see it, just posted in the chat, um, our marketing team wanted to pitch in that, you know, with Call Hub, if you're using the 10 DLC or a spam label shield features, which are available in the US, that could also help increase your pickup rates. So just, you know, wanted to throw that in there. Um, we also have another question. Uh, so with this organization, Sister District, 
they typically give you a script to start out and then you start asking questions. Um, and this, they said this doesn't always work with people over the phone. So what would you guys say is maybe a better way to start that? Um, good question. So, um, you know, um, I think, you know, as I say, as I kind of talked about, it is kind of viewing this, obviously all these conversations to be viewed as kind of, you know, the social media aspects of the campaign is not separate from the telephone arm, which isn't separate from the leaflets, it's not separate from your door-to-door -door canvases. And, you know, I think it is taking a uh, kind of voter-centric approach to these things or member-centric depending on the context you know sometimes you know some phone calling is a extremely kind of effective and efficient tool but you know as i think kind of the question alludes to it's not always the right tool and you know you have to counterbalance that with you know okay in this in, in, in this context, is it more appropriate that we take it out of the phone calling pool and into the door-to-door -door canvassing pool? Or do we not do direct contact with it at all? Do we just focus on digital digital leaflets and so on? And so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, as I say, it's about, uh, you know, kind of viewing everything within kind of the context of the campaign. And, you know, the phone calling is a, is a great tool, but it's not always the right tool you know, the medium is sometimes as important as the message. Um, I don't know what you think, Andrew, on that. Yeah, and I agree, I agree. I, th I think often, you know, if a client came to us and said, you know, we, we want to run this survey, or we kind of wanted to run a survey to kind of gather insight into to members or their opinions, uh, their views, and it was kind of quite lengthy, or the, the, the it might be questions people want to consider, perhaps, then I think what we'd probably use is probably, we'd probably have the phone calling set up where we were uh, ring someone and saying, hi, um, explain why it was important, why we wanted them to kind of ask, ask them these questions, and then send, saying, I I'm going to send you a text message, or I'm going to send you an email now uh, with a link to a survey. Um, would you be able to complete it? Um, and kind of making the case over the phone why that's important. But, you know, if, it, if, if it's kind of that something that's going to take them 15 minutes, probably the probably a phone call is, is often not the not the right not the right medium to do that so but you can still use phone calling as kind of like to to make the case as to why 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 do we deserve your time why why should you you spend time kind of answering our questions so i think anything over you know kind of a few a few minutes if it's kind of voter id kind of things like that i think you can absolutely do that over the phone but i think if it's kind of deeper insights you're looking for often uh, and of course if <laughs> You know, it, it's not like it's not possible, but it, it's kind of often uh, we would, I think, we'd probably usually kind of try to do that online and by send them send them kind of a, a text message or an email with with a link to a survey rather than try and do it all over the phone. And I think just to add to Andrew's point, you know, as campaign managers, it's it's our job to decide what's the most efficient allocation of resources. And yes, it would be great to have lots of fifteen minute phone calls where. We get this with address mm. itself, or we get this survey completed, and we get really high quality data. But it's much more efficient, and we can speak to more people and potentially get a higher contact rate by having lots of, you know, 30 seconds to two minutes conversations with more members, more voters, and direct them to an appropriate platform where they can sit down and have a coffee and complete that survey in their, in their own time rather than at a time that is convenient to us over the telephone. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so next question up is, um, is it a good idea to have a strict rule for maximum call duration? In some of their campaigns, they've seen people speak for close to an hour, which can reduce their outreach, especially if those people aren't on board with them. Yeah, I mean, we would, we, you know, you do find people who just really want to talk on the phone uh, that you call. Um, we would usually suggest, you know, that there are people who, there are, maybe 100 people on the phone who will just talk and talk and talk and you know, we'll go on forever and so i probably would recommend kind of in a polite way um to kind of trying to wrap up it i mean it depends what you're kind of calling about of course but i can't really see why you would want to from a campaigning marketing re, you know, resource perspective why you'd want to spend more than an hour or really more than kind of 
10 15 minutes and often if you do maybe you there if if somebody has something that takes an hour to explain then it's probably not the people you having doing the campaigning sort of phone calls they're probably not the best person to speak to you know for example if we were working on behalf of a charity or a trade union somebody had sort of a a work issue or they had kind of um, a complaint or a something some sort of issue they wanted to raise then we'd probably you know we'd encourage we'd redirect them to somebody else a lot of the time in terms of for your campaign phone calls i can't really see why you would there'd be many reasons why you're um uh spending kind of an hour so yeah i i i think i i would probably recommend you uh, a a, a time limit really on uh, on on phone calls. It depends what you're trying to get out of it, but I think for the vast majority of, sort of campaigning purposes, when you're trying to gather information, um, sort of nudge and persuade to an extent, but kind of uh, it it would it, it'd be very rarely would it strike me as a, a good use of resources. Maybe some fundraising. Um, it, you know, and knowing the US particularly, it's you know there, there's much sort of greater emphasis on on fundraising um, from a wider pool of donors. So perhaps that would be in, in I'm sure there would be in, in the, those circumstances. But I think for most of the sort of um, day-to-day kind of campaigning, it, there probably wouldn't be justification. I don't know. You agree, Alex? Yeah, I um, completely agree. And I think just to build on kind of one point Andrew made earlier, I think kind of the key thing here is to kind of, this is kind of the sort of thing we would explain to our agents in that there is a hard cut off and this is why there's a hard cut off and you know we give them kind of options and pivots where they can you know depending on the context of the conversation you know where they can direct members voters whoever it is to that's more appropriate it's kind of understanding the role of this telephone call in the wider campaign or the wider organization and you know putting in place whether it's a uh, you know putting in place the processes yeah a hard stop um in terms of maximum call duration but also kind of routes out of that situation to somewhere that's appropriate for it to to be directed to yeah thank you absolutely um i actually have a question myself too you know while we're on the topic of of agents and, and volunteers and since you guys have you know been doing this work for so long how have you found that having you know the technology and, and a, a supportive tech stack has supported your your agents and your volunteers when they do their outreach like what's their perspective on it so i think we've found particularly um when you have people working remotely i we've we've used i think call hub for oh god I, I think pretty much since since founded since day one i think, one, I think andrew yeah i think i'm literally day one perhaps perhaps um could be wrong but you know and we've i think it is pretty essential that you have a kind of reasonably straightforward yeah and from the user perspective you kind of want the functionality on the back end for kind of setting up the campaign but also you want the really sort of straightforward agent user experience um on the front end that we've always found uh you get with call hub and i think that is essential particularly when you have people doing things remotely as often you do um um these days but you know is is that kind of simple you know one click kind of setup that um that we've always found is, is pretty essential i think you know you, you really you know you, you want you want agents want volunteers concentrating on um on the phone call on engaging um the potential supporters um rather than kind of doing the kind of tech setup really and you know that's why we've kind of used call hub for as long as we can have because it's 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 kind of simple to to set up and use and um you guys have always been very very flexible with you know kind of uh functionality and kind of helping and um very reasonably priced as well um um so that's kind of we've we've uh yeah but i think i think it is essential i think particularly you know if you if you want if you want somebody you to volunteer for a campaign that you've never met and you want them to kind of log on and you know kind of introduce things and get them started then it, you know it needs to be something reasonably reasonably straightforward people aren't going to kind of 
spend ages kind of setting up a, a kind of um, a, a calling platform. You know, it's that's that's you. That's most likely not what they've signed up for. Um, so I think we, that's one of the reasons we use we use Call Hub is because that you know you send them a link, they activate their account, mm -hmm. it you press a button, it brings a, it it calls the person you want it to call, and um, when you're done, you fill in the details, and then you move on to the next call. That's kind of all you have to do from user experience. So that you know we. I, I think it's pretty essential that you keep things simple really these days because often you know, it's not kind of as much of a I mean you still have kind of phone banks campaign phone banks where you know you have people around a table with pizza and stuff and but you know I remember when we started I'm not that old but you know <laughs> when we first went to a political phone bank you know you'd have mobile phones and you know people would kind of pass you a mobile phone and you'd have a sheet in front of you you'd kind of take mm -hmm. names off and stuff so you know, I, I I think with more people doing things from home because they can do it from home, then I think it's pretty essential to have a kind of um, a, a kind of straightforward user interface really on your phone calling platform. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, and I'm sure I won't be the only person in this webinar today where you've used any kind of platform and you know you wanted to do something and the user guide is longer than Lord of the Rings and you have to <laughs> they've got the same article to solve the same problem in triplicate but with you know with three different solutions to it. You know, actually you do need to take a step back and think, right, what is the actual what do we actually want this tool to deliver? And as Andrew said, we want agents you know, to to be able to just concentrate on that conversation and the technology almost be running in the background, if that makes sense, to have that kind of to tread so lightly on them that, you know, that it's barely noticeable so that they can have those those quality conversations that are so vital, particularly when you only get to speak to someone once. And, you know, Call Hub, uh, you know, Call Hub have always been, you know, it, I, I mean, I kind of always, whenever I, whenever we've used Call Hub, it's always felt like it is kind of built from the campaigner's experience. And therefore, actually, as a campaigner, what do I want to get out of it? And it's been built back from there. So actually being able to kind of focus on, you know, the goals rather than the tech is such an advantage that Call Hub has. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, it's obviously we love to hear from you guys, but it's you know, so great to have a perspective on the user experience as well. Um, you know, because they're the ones actually making the calls and in the weeds of everything. So thank you. Um, so we have another question that popped up. Uh, so when surveyed, some people tend to be quite dismissive or giving up, you know, on giving up any information. Um, what are your tips for warming them up in any way? Yeah, so I think, you know, Obviously, firstly, you know, trying to make it a warm call, something, something the user, something the member or voter expects to receive before they even answer the phone when they're in the, when obviously the call takes place, you know, obviously being able to deliver those first lines of the script and kind of starting a conversation because it's not the advantage of telephone of a telephone call over and say television advert is it's a genuine two way conversation, a mediated two way conversation and playing into that take advantage of the medium is such an advantage over tele is such an advantage that telephone calling has over other mediums so yeah firstly make sure it's something that the the person expects to receive and then secondly trying to engage them right from the word go and the delivery of the first few sentences of any script are the most important um what do you think andrew yeah i think so yeah i think you know you can if you're an organization or you're a campaign, particularly if you're you're ringing your kind of members or supporters and you're asking for information, even just asking for information, you're kind of explaining, you know, kind of explain why am I doing this? Why do I want to find out about this? You know, um, we there's a lot of surveys we kind of run sometimes where it's kind of the questions, it's not automatically apparent why the campaign or organization will want to know this. So kind of saying, well, you know, we've identified you as a group, you know, we're, we're not sure kind of, we're engaging with you in the right way. We just want to kind of check in and find out like, you know, how you're feeling on this, this, and this, or, you know, make sure, you know, the kind of the opportunities for kind of campaigning in your area that you want. Kind of just a bit of explanation, really. I mean, also I will say, you know, whoever you're calling, whoever you're trying to target, there will always be a certain number of people who are just not interested um, as well. And not to, to kind of prepare people for that and to say, you know, it's just, it's just how things are, you know. If you contact enough people, there's going to be some people that are, you know, 
they're not interested. Even if they told you yesterday, they're really interested. In that. You know, uh, paid their memberships or so. Don't pay, made donation yesterday. There's still you know there's still a number of people the next day who just won't be interested. It, it you know it's reasonably rare and but it, within any pool you know it's it's I think it's worth always preparing people for not being disheartened when they kind of get people who are just like very quite as you said dismissive. But um, you know the, as I said you know, there are things you can do just kind of explaining and you know a lot of the organisations that we work with and campaigns you know it's kind of it's kind of um, it's quite sincere you know they we're kind of ringing up because. Uh, we want to find out how they can do a better job or kind of engage with them better and kind of um, so I, I think it's kind of trying to explain that and trying to put that across authentically that you are you do genuinely want to know what their um, what what their views are on, 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 on certain topics or you do genuinely want them to get involved in the campaign um, you know it's kind of uh, I think comes across you know if it's kind of authentic and often it is and so you know, kind of trying to convey that as as quickly as possible, really. Yeah, that's great. Um, next question. So what are your thoughts on agents working from home versus working in a room or an office together? So I think we've, since 2017, when we began doing this, we've always had a, almost a, I wouldn't call it a hybrid, I call it a dispersed approach where we've had, you know, teams that based in our office in Manchester, but also kind of teams of uh, teams based at home for various reasons. Um, you know, it's always kind of worked pretty well for us. And I think the advantage, going back to your earlier question, Elizabeth, about having a tech stack that kind of supports this. Actually, the Cool Hub tech stack supports you know having agents in any any one any one of thousands of locations, and yet still feeling like you're part of the team still be you know still be having that kind of that team ethic and that's kind of really important when you're doing any kind of mass calling hitting you know campaigns have targets to meet and it's really important to hit them um and the as i say the advantage that call hub has is that it gives you that flexibility built into the system i mean and has always kind of Oh, uh, you know, opened us up, and, you know, has opened us up to not just have kind of really good people, really good agents in Manchester making calls, but really good agents based wherever they want to, wherever they want to live. I think we've had agents based in the far north of Scotland at various points, Andrew, and you know, uh, in London, you know, you know, all delivering kind of all delivering kind of accept all delivering the kind of the same levels of efficiency that we'd expect from them if they were based in the office as well. Yeah, I, I think there's kind of two 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 points I'd make, I suppose. I I suppose the first is I, I still think kind of you know, the kind of gold standard in terms of motivating people and sharing information is probably people in an, in one office together, kind of um you know, where you can chat between phone calls. People can say, Oh, you know, I had this issue, I had this come up, and you can kind of say, Oh yeah, I had that issue as well. And you can kind of have a dialogue between people very easily in person. I think that's still kind of the the ideal in many ways, um, in terms of people feeling like they're a team, in terms of, you know, kind of cohesion. I think it's still kind of a gold standard really. But on the second point, I think a lot of kind of campaigns political campaigns are you know they're quite pragmatic organizations they are flexible pragmatic and you know often people work in, now we have the technology for people to work in flexible ways i think campaigns particularly political campaigns you know absolutely should take advantage of that because often you know particularly with volunteers you really want as many volunteers as you can get a lot of the time or you can use productively and this the technology that we have now with remote working with remote phone calling pretty much you know i like i said i i kind of i think there's a lot to be said for kind of in person but the the gap has narrowed so much that i think you know all political campaigns really when it comes to kind of phone calling i i would imagine you know there's there's not really any good reason not to allow a certain degree of of kind of remote phone calling really or kind of remote activism, really, because there's just so many ways people can be used productively, or get involved and be productive. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's super important. Um, I think it's going to be our last question, and then uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. 
Um, but what are some of the most important features that are a must have to run a successful campaign? So I think um, I think you know if there's one one takeaway from this, it's that the most successful successful feature campaign has is listening to its data. Kind of lesson lesson one for us. You know, if you're not listening to data, then you don't know what's happening, and if you don't know what's happening, that's a recipe uh, for disaster. Um, that that I think is the most uh, important feature for a successful campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think knowing what you're trying to what you want to achieve, you would hope that most campaigns already do that really. But um, I think knowing how to use the resources you have and getting the most out of the resources that you have, and knowing what you're trying to achieve, I think there's there's some campaigns, particularly kind of when you when you move away from politics and you move away from kind of trade union disputes, and you're kind of just in the kind of like fat, you know kind of listening exercises kind of thing that you know you. It's always handy to, to kind of know what concrete steps, what are you trying to, what's your hypothesis you're trying to prove or disprove kind of thing, you know, it's, it's kind of how often we try and kind of frame it when you kind of don't have that kind of clear end, end goal that you do in a political campaign. I think, you know, we often, when we kind of doing kind of membership research and kind of market research, we often start with kind of a hypothesis that kind of prove or disprove it's just a really good kind of you know because then we can at the end we'll say well is this true is this not is our our view of the this group of people was it proved right or was it kind of proved wrong uh and give the kind of campaign some sort of sort of structure and aims and something sort of quantifiable to be able to uh judge them by yeah thank you so much um all right well i think that's actually our last question we had um Thank you so much, Alex and Andrew, for being here today and giving this great presentation. And thank you for everybody who joined and listened in, uh, who participated through the chat and asked questions. You know, this has been a, a great, a great presentation for all. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks very much, for everyone. In particular, time. thank you, particularly thank you to you, Elizabeth, for uh, for hosting us this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.